Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Green, and I'm the president of the AIA. Welcome to the March 2023 edition of Archaeology Abridged. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Archaeological Institute of America is North America's oldest and the world's largest archaeological organization, with over 200,000 supporting and subscribing members. From its founding in 1879, the AIA has been committed to supporting archaeology and archaeologists, to publishing and disseminating the results of archaeological research, and providing programming like this one for a variety of audiences. If you aren't familiar with the AIA, we're a membership organization. Our programs are supported by our members, so thank you to all of our members today. And if you're not a member yet, please do join us. You can read all about the benefits of membership on our website at archaeological.org join. And by becoming a member, you can stay apprised of all of our upcoming programs. I want to emphasize that beyond the support we receive from our members, the breadth of programming that the AIA provides is only possible because of our donors. We could not do public programs like this one or back archaeologists to support future discoveries without our amazing and dedicated donors. If you can, we encourage you to join this group of contributors with a gift, large or small. Again, you can donate right on our website at www.archaeological.org slash donate. Please note, this is a live presentation. The AIA will be recording this presentation, but we ask that you do not. If you'd like to see the recording from today's talk, we'll post it on the AIA's YouTube channel within the next few days, and we'll send everyone who's registered a link when it's ready. If you joined us for David's talk that gave an archaeological perspective on the Spanish invasion of Aztec Mexico, today's format will differ quite a bit. Archaeology abridged, as the name hints at, is a shorter talk, so David will give a briefer presentation, and that'll be followed by ample time for questions. We love to see your questions, and since there are a lot of you here on here, and the chat tends to get lively as well, we ask that you use Zoom's dedicated Q&A box to submit your questions for David so they don't get lost and save the chat for greetings and other things. I'm so excited today, and it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce you all to Dr. David Carballo. David Carballo is professor of anthropology, archaeology, and Latin American studies at Boston University, where he's also associate provost for general education. He specializes in the archaeology of Latin America, especially central Mexico, and has topical interests in households, urbanism, religion, social inequality, and working with contemporary communities in understanding ancient ones. Current investigations focus on Teotihuacan's Tlahinga district, a cluster of non-elite neighborhoods on the periphery of what was then the largest city in the Americas. His recent books include Cooperation and Collective Action, Archaeological Perspectives, an edited volume from 2013, Urbanization and Religion in Ancient Central Mexico from 2016, Teotihuacan, The World Beyond the City, an edited volume from 2020, and most recently, Collision of Worlds, a Deep History into the Fall of Aztec Mexico and the Forging of New Spain from 2020. His talk today is titled Traitors or Native Conquistadors, the Role of Tlaxcala in the Fall of Aztec Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Carballo. Thanks, Liz. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Uh, this is a different format from last week, but um, I hope there'll be some time uh, where people who tuned in last week could ask questions that maybe we couldn't get to. Um, so, it, you know, it's a pleasure to talk briefly about a, a part of the world that is near and dear to my heart, uh, Tlaxcala, located in central Mexico. This, um, I was prompted to do this last book project really because of my work there and 
uh, thinking about the, the deep time connections that entangled Tlaxcala and other parts of Mexico with the transatlantic world and eventually the trans-Pacific world. Um, over here on the cover, you can see uh, this is a uh, mural art uh, clip from the, what essentially is the city hall or the governmental palace in Tlaxcala. Um, the artist was named Desiderio Hernandez Sochitiotzin, and I worked with uh, his daughter to get permission to use the image. Um, the the uh, walls of this city hall or governmental palace are completely covered by Desiderio's murals that recount the history of the state of Tlaxcala from early pre-Hispanic times up to the 20th century. Um, and here you can see this pivotal encounter with some of the protagonists for today. Uh, so for instance, um, Hernando Cortez on the right and Chicon Tecat the elder, one of the, the rulers in a system of co-rule government in Tlaxcala to the left being mediated by the native translator Malinsli, who spoke both Nahuatl, the Aztec language, um, and a Mayan language, Yucatec Mayan, and could mediate this, this translation uh, with a Spaniard who also knew Mayan. And she actually eventually earned, uh, uh, learned Spanish herself and could be the sole translator of this encounter. So um, I first came to Tlaxcala and started working there archaeologically in 1999. And, um, and ever since then, I, there have been people there who have asked, What's this with being traders? What you know, people say that that the, the ancient Tlaxcal texts were were traders of some sort. Is that true? What's behind that? And um, and so so that part of the history has always been there since I first arrived in the state. If you look at this map on the left, you can see that Tlaxcala is the smallest state in Mexico. It's uh, it's it's pretty tiny, but it it roughly um, corresponds to the pre-Hispanic polity of Tlaxcalan, um, and then the colonial period Indian Republic of Tlaxcala, as it was designated. Um, it's, you know, it's so small that I, we sometimes would drive down with our field vehicle from Los Angeles and cross the border. And when we'd be asked, where are you going? We'd say Tlaxcala, and they'd say, oh, Tlaxcala Puebla, meaning the larger state that surrounds it on all three sides, that it wasn't even recognized as its own state. Um, so, uh, so at least you know on the borderlands, uh, people are not as aware of uh, Tlaxcala existing as its own entity. But in the center of the country, there has been this narrative, particularly out of Mexico City, and I'll show some of the reasons why that is of um, the Tlaxcala having uh, being having been traitors to uh, the native peoples of Mesoamerica in allying with the Spaniards. But you can see on the bottom right image um, that sign welcome you into the city says cuna de la nacion which means cradle of the nation so um, there's a different portrayal within Pascala itself um, and on the bottom left the the heroic figure of Shikontekat the younger who is the the son of Shikontekat the elder that you see in that mural on top left and they're two key protagonists one of the ways I became interested in these connections was well first living in the railroad town of Apisaco, which is um, in northern central Tlaxcala. And you can see on the bottom right where they have one of these glorietas or roundabouts with, uh, with a, a, a locomotive on it. And um, I was very aware of this being a crossroads. In fact, it is um, the place where the first rail line in Mexico was created linking the port city of Veracruz to the capital city of Mexico City. And that sort of formed this particular town as, as an entity. Um, it, but those routes go back way further. And in fact, uh, you know, what we call the, the, the route or corridor of communication through Tlaxcala had a Nahuatl name, meaning the Great Road. And so the Great Road went uh, no, through northern Tlaxcala. Um, and, um, and we'll look at that in a, in a bit. Uh, but I was interested archaeologically in, in looking at where sites were located and movement through the landscape and relationships between sites. And so first, one of my first studies was, was uh, based on geographical information systems. This was done with a colleague, Tom Pluckon, of calculating what would be the best routes uh, from different 
um, capital cities of central Mexico, mostly located in the basin of Mexico around today's Mexico City. So places like Teotihuacan, where I have spent a lot of my career, and then the later Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, uh, which is now the heart of Mexico City. Um, and so you can see at, uh, over here on the, these, these two little images that popped up on the map, one is a Teotihuacan that became the first mega city uh, in central Mexico. And then to the right is a site called Cantona. And Cantona is a very interesting site. Um, it is the site with the most ball courts in Mesoamerica. It has some 25 ball courts. And it's developed over these badlands with all these sorts of um, uh, little plaza centers stuck together in, in this web of terraces and roads. And uh, I think many archaeologists, myself included, think that Cantona developed as a resistance to the expansion of Teotihuacan, who we know expanded through this area for trade uh, corridors and connections with the lowlands, which had resources like cacao and uh, precious bird feathers and, and uh, marine resources. So some of that history of a corridor of Plascala being in a crossroads, then later manifested in the Aztec period, where Tenochtitlan became the capital of the Mexica, that's the dominant uh, ethnic group that, of the group that we call Aztec. Uh, and their capital city of Tenochtitlan was the largest in the Americas at its time. And Tlaxcala uh, developed its own city and a, a quite different pattern of urbanism. Um, whereas Tenochtitlan might have had 200 or so thousand people living in it, Tlaxcala might have had more like 40 or 50,000 people. And rather than have a centralized precinct with a major temple complex like Tenochtitlan, you can see Tlaxcala is this network of um, terraces and plazas, again, almost like Cantona that was a thousand years earlier as a resistance to Teotihuacan, but here uh, as a resistance to Tenochtitlan and the Mexica expansion into the area. This map shows in the shaded area um, the boundaries roughly of what we call the Aztec Empire or Triple Alliance, and then the different journeys of the um, two uh, conquistadors or explorers who, who preceded Cortes and were actually following orders and not invading. They were just were doing reconnaissance. But then Cortes, who, who uh, breached the chain of command and, and launched an invasion that he wasn't authorized to do, um, and uh, his path from Veracruz that you see uh, on the Gulf of Mexico inland uh, to first Tlaxcala and then to Tenochtitlan. So we know Tlaxcala from different sources. Some are historic ones from the 16th century and some are archeological. Um, as we know, whenever we read sources, we need to think of who was the author, what was the intended audience, why were they writing, what are potential biases. And in the case of Tlaxcala, they were making the claim in the 16th century that they had always been loyal allies to the Spanish crown, to Cortes and the other Spaniards. Um, and so that was their narrative as they were trying to um, uh, maintain certain autonomy that they had as an early colonial Indian Republic. But we do know based on other sources, close reading of different sources, plus archaeological materials, that um, what we call Tlaxcalan, the, you know, the, um, the Aztec period polity, was a mix of two ethnic groups primarily. There were Nahuas, those are people who speak Nahuatl with the Aztec language, and there were also um, Otomi, you can see on the bottom right, uh, that the, the uh, descendant community usually uses terms like Nyahnu. Um, and they live more in the north of the state, so those blue triangles versus the yellow triangles that you see here. Um, we worked primarily in the center and north of the state, and also, I should say, primarily on earlier periods, um, but there was everywhere we looked material relating to this focal period of about 500 years ago or so, um, and um, the, the Aztec period and the uh, Spanish invasion the documents are somewhat opaque when it comes to how, the exact route that uh, the the uh, Spaniards, by um, who by this time also had some native allies acting as porters, they were Totonacs from the Gulf Coast. But we think that we can identify, based on our work here, 
the entry point and the first encounter with, with people from Tlaxcala, though these were Otomis, not Nahuas, in a place called Tecoac. And that's based on calculating a few of the conquistador accounts, how many leagues they traveled. Um, and so the entrance point would have been somewhere, something around here, uh, coming through the mountains and entering into uh, Tlaxcala. And where we worked would be on the outskirts of Tecoac as a larger Otomi uh, city-state or polity. And some work there, one of my former graduate students, Laura Heath Stout, did a master's thesis on the ceramics from this period. And we can see that they have lots of connections, even though they're a different ethnic group, they're Otomis, not Nawas, to the Nawas who lived in Tlaxcala. So we see many ceramic uh, similarities and even the sort of, sort of trade relations they were having. It was very clear based on the materials that they were in close interaction. So something else we see in Tlaxcala is that uh, it had a social organization, socio-political organization that we would call more collective. And we get this from comments like from Cortez himself, who said, this was not a monarchy. This, is a, this was a, um, a republic along the lines of the Northern Italian ones of the day, so Venice and Genoa, and he made those explicit comparisons. But we can also see drawing on documents of the period and archeological patterns that there wasn't a single dominant palace or ruler, that there were some sort of power sharing agreements. There was a very large governing council that included commoners, and there was a focus more on deities, not rulers, including the patron deity, who is an avatar of the great smoking mirror deity, Tetzcatlipoca. Um, and you can see on the left, there's an image of, uh, of this particular avatar, who uh, is called Mishkoat Kamashli. And uh, the interesting thing about Tetzcatlipoca is he's often juxtaposed, like the image on the top right, with Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, who was a god of the nobility and rulership, where Tetzcatlipoca is this, he, he has this obsidian mirror that is almost used for divination, and he can see he's, he's um, omniscient to some degree, and he can see, he has sort of a more of a moral structure uh, to his identity than some of the other Aztec gods. One of the wonderful uh, sources of information that we have from Tlaxcala comes from this document called the Lienzo of Tlaxcala um, that was first done in the mid 16th century, three different copies that all unfortunately were lost, but they had been copied down um, in, in, in later periods. And we have those copies. They're probably based on murals that originally were in the Cabildo or governing house at um, Tlaxcala itself. And they relay different events in this encounter, like the entrance on the top right into the region, the uh, first um, uh, confrontations, although here you see that they don't look like confrontations. They look like giving gifts to Cortez uh, and, uh, and other Spaniards. Um, and then the sort of regrouping that happened after the Spanish and Tlaxcaltecs were kicked out of Tenochtitlan uh, in an event that's known by the Spanish as the sad night, the Noche Triste, um, and regrouped in Tlaxcala. And you can see all the turkeys and, and uh, corn and other uh, and resources, the horses getting fed grass, that was part of that regrouping and rearming for the final siege on the city. So we do know one of the places that we worked um, is called Tzampantepec, it's this hill over here, and we do have accounts. Now here, usually when I read Spanish and native accounts, I'm, I'm um, uh, more inclined to believe the native accounts. But in this case, the Tlaxcal texts were trying to minimize the fact that there had ever been conflict with them and the Spanish. So they don't recount that there were 20 days of fighting um, in Zompantepec, uh, and uh, but we do get that from the conquistador accounts like Cortez's and Bernal Diaz. We also get that in native documents like this one, the Wamantla map. This was made by Otomis, not Nawas. And so they weren't as concerned about showing their loyalty. And they, they depicted this very graphic scene of conquest uh, that you can see here. So the Tlaxcal texts, um, more depicted themselves like this was the front piece of the Lienzo of Tlaxcala. Um, the four major partitions of their polity 
with their different rulers in the front. But here you can see this is in a colonial context of the 16th century. You can see the, the uh, crest of um, Carlos I, the, the king of Spain, the Habsburg eagle there. But also in the center, you can see this hill glyph. And that's how central Mexicans depicted city-states. And so this was the, still the sort of city-state of Tlaxcala. It now was connected to Spain and also to Christianity, if you see the cross on the bottom. But they depict uh, over some 130, 140 different corporate houses that were part of the decision-making in this, in, this, um, in this polity, this more pluralistic polity. And when we look at Tlaxcala itself archaeologically, work of my colleague Aurelio Lopez, whose picture is on top right, uh, and then also Lane Farger is the archaeologist who mapped the, the site, like you see the map on the left. It's this network of different terraces, distributed plazas. There's not one single real precinct or palatial precinct. Rather, it's this more... Uh, heterarchical structure rather than a hierarchical one. It has different segments together, bonded together. On the bottom right is a um, illustration by uh, Rafael Mena, and he's depicting the debate that we know that the Tlaxcaltecs had as they were battling with the Spaniards over these 20 days of whether they should join forces or not, and what might be the pluses and minuses for them. Uh, in terms of, of allying themselves with the Spaniards. Eventually, of course, they did, and that was part of the you know, key um, military operation of providing 10 to 30,000 soldiers that became the fighting force for the Spaniards. But it should also be pointed out there were many other indigenous groups who allied themselves eventually. And one of the real uh, major ones were the Akolwa of Texcoco. Texcoco was the second largest city in the Triple Alliance Empire, and it then became the port for launching a naval attack uh, um, uh, and sieging the city of Tenochtitlan. Later, the Tlaxcaltecs continued, and other indigenous peoples continued to um, uh, uh, be involved in these wars of conquest or expansion that created New Spain, uh, the, the forerunner of Mexico. And, and some of those are depicted in this lienzo de Tlaxcala, like over here, you can see this one particular battle in the Northeast in Panuco. And here are some other images. One of the uh, interesting things uh, that um, Asselberg's over here, this bottom right quote that you have, uh, she's an art historian who comments on first the fact that the classical texts always depicted themselves. You can see how richly attired they are. There's a lot of attention to the garments they were wearing, the warrior costumes, and they're usually depicted in the vanguard. They are leading the charge here rather than being behind as some supporting role. So they're depicting themselves as conquerors and, victor and victors rather than victims. Some of the larger uh, campaigns or more distant campaigns that the Tlaxcaltecs were involved in took them with the Oñate expedition up to Santa Fe, New Mexico that you see on the top, and then later leaving from the port of Acapulco, crossing the Pacific to the Philippines and making that connection um, with trade routes connected to China, uh, you know, within Manila, there was a Chinese um, barrio that uh, had traders and, and the galleons would, would come from the Philippines uh, back to Mexico, be transshipped overland uh, to Veracruz and then continue on to Europe. So this involvement of the Tlaxcal texts really left a profound historical legacy and also a material legacy. And you can see that places, um, for instance, if you visit Santa Fe, you can see the San Miguel Church. So the full name is San Miguel de Analco. And that's very interesting because San Miguel Analco is a really important site in Tlaxcala. It was a place that has springs and was previously a, um, a shrine to the storm god or water god Tlaloc, um, but then later became the name, the, the Aztec name or the Nahuatl name, Analco, connected to this first church uh, in Santa Fe. Um, in the north of Mexico, for instance, in Saltillo, in the northeast, there are uh, um, vestiges or, or legacies from uh, Tlaxcaltec 
uh, involvement there. Um, on the top right image, you see this convent where these uh, groups left from in these expeditions up to the north. And they brought things like serapes as a, as a traditional Central Mexican uh, textile form, and also pan de pulque. Pulque is a fermented maguey sap uh, that's also a Central Mexican drink. But perhaps even more interesting just for the distance are the connections through the Pacific. And um, one of my collaborators at the uh, University of Barcelona has worked on a project in Guam. And there you see Mexican style grinding stones, metates that also came through this uh, trans-Pacific connection. So for some 80 years, the Tlaxcaltecs then did enjoy some benefits from this alliance, but they were constantly fighting for it and negotiating their place uh, in, in this new colonial order. Um, they uh, adopted certain things of, of the colonizers. For instance, Christianity, they converted uh, relatively rapidly. You see this uh, bell tower here from the convent of San Francisco, one of the oldest churches on the mainland Americas, and also other trappings like, for instance, bullfights. You can see this big bull ring in the center of Tlaxcala. No Spaniards could live in Tlaxcala other than the clergy, and they maintained their own governmental structure, somewhat modified, but basically their council became under a new name, a cabildo. Um, and you can see places, so here's Tlaxcala as the center of a new colonial um, order, but then these subsidiary centers around uh, the capital city that were that were uh, major towns of the pre-Hispanic period um, all became monastery centers that you see over here. Um, and many of them have the very characteristic colonial syncretic form of architecture of an open chapel because native peoples were not accustomed to going into a dark building for a, a service. They were accustomed to being in an open plaza and hearing the service. And so these these colonnades and these, these arches were places where mass would be said um, in the 16th century. They also advocated for themselves in text. And the longest along these lines is by the mestizo author, Diego Munoz Camargo. He had a Spanish father and an indigenous classical tech mother. And he wrote a long history of his people that then he brought across the Atlantic to Spain and presented to the then king, uh, Philip II. And here you can see his, his take on these issues. So that the Tenochcas, the people of Tenochtitlan, had you know the uh, ruler Moctezuma who wanted to be a universal uh, lord. Um, and the classical text, this is a, a dialogue between some ambassadors and the and the Mexica, uh, that they they wouldn't recognize any uh, overlord, that uh, the classical texts have always preserved their freedom. And so this is some of his positioning of, of um, his people in the 16th century. Now, so where does an idea of treason come into the scene? Well, I mean, after Mexico's independence, and then especially after the revolutionary period of the early 20th century, some of the identity formation revolved around um, the precursors to Mexico City as the new power center, um, people looked to the Mexica in particular, the, the core of what was earlier Mexico City. And evidence of that is everywhere. It's on the flag, the founding of Tenochtitlan. It's on the money. Um, bef it, now they've changed their jerseys, although I, I have one of these because I, I uh, of course, can't resist not having a sunstone uh, Mexican jersey, but the, the football team, the tree, the 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 the, uh, the um, national football team used to wear the Aztec sunstone and play in Aztec Stadium. They still do, and you could see that on Aztec TV. So, so that identity was very central and and centralized in the capital, and not so much other indigenous groups like the Maya, the Zapotec, or the Tlaxcaltecs. So, just to end here. Um, this obviously is a topic of momentous importance historically to global history, um, but also to contemporary Mexican identity. And that's been um, debated in many ways and commemorated in many ways. So as some examples with the quincentennial of the end of the Spanish uh, uh, Aztec War um, that was in 2021, 1521 to 2021, there was a, all sorts of commemoration. Within Mexico City, here you see the mayor commemorating a change in name 
from the plaza of the sad night, which is a Spanish perspective, um, to the plaza of a victorious night when the Tenochka, the people of Tenochtitlan, pushed both the Spaniards and the Tlaxcaltecs out of their capital city. Tlaxcala also has this complex relationship with their role in history. So on the one hand, there's the um, Chicontecat, the elder that you see on the bottom, greeting Cortez. But then there's his son, and he's the actual the one who stands in the plaza um, as a warrior. He advised against making this alliance. And so his sort of act of resistance, his more resisting personality, is personified um, by this monument in the central plaza. So it is a complex history for sure, but I think one that has turned in recent scholarship to think about what was what were the possibilities for native agency within this colonial encounter in this, this system of domination by a European power on these new lands? What were the possibilities for action and how did people make the best of, in many cases, a bad situation or act strategically um, to their advantage? So thank you, I'll end there and I'm happy to field questions. Liz, should I take, um, should I just read some? And no, I, I, some I, I actually wanted to um, thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble turning my camera and my uh, sound back on. Let me say thank you on behalf of everyone. And you can see the many, many, many applause hands uh, zooming up to, to the top. We're so grateful to you for this amazing and wonderful talk. And I see there are loads of questions in the chat and maybe the way we can uh, operate as long as you've got the chat there is for you to read them and answer them at your uh, level. But before you do that, um, I want to take my prerogative as as president and ask a starting question of my own which is uh, whether you could speak for a minute or two about the response of the local community to the archaeological work that you've been doing. To what degree are, you know, what's the reaction to the changing history, the more nuanced history of a past that, that celebrates both that alliance and resistance? Yeah, no, it's a wonderful question. And I, you know, in my experience in working in a few parts of Mexico, um, Tlaxcala, people in Tlaxcala by and large have this engagement with history that's at a somewhat, or I, I should say at least with this chapter in history, the sort of pre-Hispanic to colonial transition that is just a, at a higher level, a little more informed, a little more engaged. And maybe that's because they're asking themselves this exact question, like, should we feel conflicted about this role in the unfolding of colonialism. Um, and so when I first got there, uh, we were studying in an earlier period, the formative to, to classic period transition, it's you know, a good 1500 years before these events. And everybody was like, well, who cares about that pyramid, or that period that you know, the, there's a few, there's a, a, a later site called Kakashla that has very nice murals. People would sort of understand doing archeology span along those lines or looking at the uh, post-classic classical texts would make more sense to them and not so much these sort of earlier Neolithic-like chapters um, in the state's history. But um, there, there was this fascination and when I would do community talks, there was always a lot of engagement um, and, and uh, positive feedback about, about doing it. Um, and now more recently, I should say, you know, that this, um, you know, some of my work does engage with this directly, this, this later period, but um, uh, more of my colleagues, like Aurelio Lopez in particular, is a good collaborator who is at the uh, Centro Ina Tlaxcala, that, that's the sort of the regional center of the Anthropological Institute. Um, and he's actually organized a, um, so there's one program where you get sort of a certificate, like a diploma in Tlaxcala studies. And I've um, contributed to some of those talks. And it's really fascinating that, you know, there's such an appetite for engaging um, with history. One other 
point is just that um, Tlaxcala not only has like an archaeological museum with some of these artifacts that you've seen, uh, it's a small one, but it's in that same convent that was, you know, one of the earliest um, uh, Christian churches in the mainland. Um, but then on the plaza, and sort of in front of that statue to the, the uh, warrior Shikontekat is a museum of memory, which is, you know, they like so of historical memory. And it really engages with things like the Lienzo de Tlaxcala um, as a document. Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, and, the, and so just an entire museum to frame historical memory of a collective people um, is not something you see everywhere. And so I think it sort of speaks to this higher level of engagement. Um, okay, I'm going to take some here that I see. So Richard asks, was the practice of warfare for capturing individuals for sacrifice common throughout the Valley of Mexico, including, for example, among Tlaxcalans? And um, that is um, to some degree yes and to some degree no, in that I would say that in among uh, Tenochtitlan, in particular the Tenochtitlan, there was more of a priority in captive taking for sacrifice and the scale of sacrifice was higher. But it wasn't unknown to people of Tlaxcala and other smaller city-states or polities in the area um, and so, uh, actually, in Tlaxcala, what they commemorate more was the fact that there was a great warrior who was actually Otomi rather than Nawa, but his name was Tlawikol, and he was supposed to be very strong, this strong, strapping warrior who was captured by the Mexica um, and brought to Tenochtitlan, and he was supposed to undergo gladiatorial sacrifice, which is the one where if you've seen these very large stones that look like a sunstone, um, that uh, the captive would be tied with a rope um, and uh, to the stone and then have a broadsword that usually should have obsidian that's called a maquawit, but his would have cotton balls in it instead of obsidian. And he'd have to face off against an actual Aztec warrior, a high-ranking Aztec warrior, essentially a spectacle of sacrifice. Um, but according to this narrative, he fended off three or more warriors and was given his freedom. And, um, and so he's seen then as a hero there it, within Tlaxcala City. There's a big statue to him uh, near the bus depot. Um, and so, you know, there's a little more framing of captive taking, but being able to beat the gladiatorial combat um, uh, within Tlaxcala. Um, Frank asks about just the violence today in Mexico and how's that affecting archaeologists. Um, it, it, you know, fortunately, uh, in most of the country, like I have found very safe. We take our family, we take our kids there. Um, in this country, there's, you know, a lot of uh, media about um, violence. It, it is true there is violence along the border. Of course, smuggling uh, activities uh, relate to that, um, both smuggling people and smuggling contraband. Um, and then somewhat in the west of the country where there are uh, drug corridors and some some growing or, or um, uh, labs. Um, but but in general, no, I feel very safe in Mexico and and uh, it, it hasn't impinged any of, of my work in the center of the country. Um, it, so one of the so uh, Amir asked if there's similarities, if there's some motifs on ceramics I showed that do look like and they're actually called in Spanish a Greca, meaning like it's, it's like a Greek like motif, these little squirrely motifs. Um, and um, and those are, you know, it's just the result of independent evolution. They do have some similar uh, attributes, but um, uh, they, uh, you know, have their own sort of lineage in Mesoamerica and um, in um, uh, uh, Greece. Um, uh, Greg asks if there are, um, if classic period Teotihuacan has some similarities in organization to Tlaxcala. So that's something I've uh, um, you know, engaged quite a bit because I'm interested in both places. Um, I do think Teotihuacan has elements of it that speak to a more corporate structure, a more sort of um, a pluralistic decision-making structure. We know of this throughout 
post-classic Mesoamerica. So we know of situations of co-rule um, where there could be anywhere between two to seven co-rulers, depending on the polity that we're talking of the Aztec period. Um, so that's a possibility, but also having a really strong council that um, elects the next leader is was very common in central Mexico in the post-classic period. And I would imagine that it also extended earlier to places like Teotihuacan. Um, why? Because we don't see obvious depictions of rulers. It's hard to pinpoint a single palace. It's hard to pinpoint a royal burial. Um, nevertheless, there was a strong class distinction between uh, you know, more noble families and uh, and and, um, and non-elites, where I've been working most recently is on the periphery of Teotihuacan, and there that would be normal, you know, probably the, I would say the bottom quartile or third, socioeconomically speaking, of the city. And their apartments, one of the amazing things about Teotihuacan is everyone lived in apartments, which is very rare for the pre-modern world, maybe unique. Um, but they, the apartments in where I work in Tlahinga, uh, were made of simpler construction materials, more adobe. They didn't have the nice plaster and mural paintings on them like you see in the center of Teotihuacan. But we have extremely elaborate spaces for public use within the neighborhoods. So they did invest in this infrastructure at the neighborhood level. And I think it, it speaks to a little more parity or equality among uh, the city's population, which I also expect was the same in Tlaxcala. Now, the big difference, though, is Tlaxcala doesn't have an obvious center to it, where Teotihuacan does. There's obvious, you know, huge pyramids, and um, there's an obvious difference between the center of the city and the outskirts, where in Tlaxcala, it, it, it you know, looks like this web of terraces and distributed um, plazas. So yeah, someone said Romans, and uh, that there are some people who lived in apartments, but the Roman insuli were about a quarter of the population, where in Teotihuacan it was over 90% of the population lived in cities, um, close to everybody did, which um, to, to my understanding is unique in the pre-modern world. Um, let's see. So yeah, so Octavio asks is, how much is Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent god, tied to monarchies? Um, and so is there this difference between, you know, uh, pro Quetzalcoatl being a more monarchical faction versus anti being a, um, you know, a, I don't want to say democratic, but more pluralistic, more inclusive um, sort of political formation. Now that, I should say that that interpretation comes out of my colleague's work Lane Farger and others, um, and but I do think that there's something compelling to it. There, there, you know, there are people who are interested in, you know, when and where in human history do you get moralizing gods? Meaning, do you get gods that seem to judge, and, and um, uh, well, seem to judge the activities, be able to see, and then also uh, uh, have value judgments, moral value judgments on the activities of humans. And um, in, in many Mesoamerican, it doesn't work extremely well for Mesoamerica. Mesoamerican religion was pantheistic. It, you know, the sacredness permeated the universe and creation. Gods weren't outside of that. It's a different way of seeing the world than a monarchical or polytheistic religion. But we can say that Hetzcatlipoca, the smoking mirror, um, who was a real high god for the Aztecs, had some attributes of being moralizing. We have references in oral traditions, the words of the ancients um, and the, the moral rhetoric traditions um, that Tezcalipoca was sort of omniscient. He could, within his obsidian mirror, see the activities of others. And there is one great um, uh, narrative that is, is, um, is Tezcatlipoca versus Quetzalcoatl, where uh, Tezcatlipoca shines the mirror on Quetzalcoatl and uh, he, Quetzalcoatl sees his true self and is conflicted by his true self. Uh, and so he leaves the great city of Tolan. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that's one of these lines of evidence that there was this sort of uh, dualism between the two gods. A lot of Mesoamerican religion, the Aztecs in particular, um, had a, a principle of generative dualisms, two opposed what we might think of as opposed forces 
that can be combined and create a whole that is generative. So for instance, water and fire is this couplet in Nahuatl, it's at plachinoli, burning water. It's, and it's sort of a creative force. It's a force that's um, tied to warfare. Um, and just like that, I think that the, the, the dualism between the feathered serpent god and the smoking mirror god was this generative dualism in the, in the minds of um, Aztec uh, religion, religious practice. Uh, let's see. So Dorothy asks, um, how, how do you distinguish the preservation of these sites compared with uh, other areas in the Americas? Um, and what accounts for preservation differences? And yeah, this is a really important issue um, where, of course, you know, construction and more perishable materials like stone is going to preserve longer. And so uh, we do have that. Um, for many, most sites in central Mexico are, are built out of volcanic stone, and so that, that preserves better. Um, but we also face the issue of uh, urbanism, that this is, you know, Mexico City is one of the biggest cities in the world um, and is growing, uh, and so that um, affects the archaeological record underfoot or that is nearby and adjacent, sort of in a, you know, suburban or, or um, uh, uh, adjacent to the urban zone uh, area. And so that, that's what we're facing somewhat in Teotihuacan, which um, even in my own lifetime, I've worked there about 25 years. And, you know, you used to go from Mexico City to Teotihuacan, and it'd be, you know, 45 minutes or so. Imag imagining traffic is great, which it is not always. It could take longer than that. But like, a half hour of that would be riding through cornfields and 15 minutes through sort of city. Um, and now that's really changed. It's almost the opposite. It's like you're in sort of rural areas for 10 to 15 minutes, but the, the urban expanse has, has uh, crept up to the Northeast there. So we do face challenges, of course, with contemporary development. I think that's one of the really important issues for engaging with uh, local communities among many others, but, um, but you know, just, uh, having conversations about, okay, we understand that uh, you need to expand your houses, you need to um, thrive in life in the present. At the same time, there's, you know, interest in understanding what's here in this archaeological site before new construction happens. How can we work together to prioritize? What should we do? Where should we work next? Um, and these sorts of questions uh, as well. Um, so, you know, in general, Mexico, there's decent preservation because of the construction material, but because of wet dry cycles, organics usually do not preserve very well. Um, a a um, exception to that is in some places where there is wet preservation. So for instance, both at the Aztec main temple, the Templo Mayor, and also in this uh, recently excavated tunnel under Teotihuacan with this big offering, both of them were under the water table and allowed for really good preservation of organics that we typically don't see. Um, let's see. Uh, so a few questions I maybe could um, group here. So how do modern Tlaxcalan descendants benefit from their ancestors' alliance? Uh, how long did they have a, a system of, of um, self-rule? Uh, also, uh, the role of disease. I think um, I think that you know all of these are are extremely critical. Disease. The first disease epidemic that broke out in central Mexico occurred in the middle of the Spanish Aztec War. So that is 1519 to 1521, and in 1520, um, from a, a sort of a, a, a group of other Spaniards coming to the coast, led by someone named Narvaez, is when they think the the um, some sort of epidemic, which is still a little difficult to identify. New DNA analyses are, are um, attempting to do this. There's been some work showing salmonella in early colonial populations. Smallpox is uh, the one that has been most discussed because uh, when there are depictions, for instance, of the, um, the symptoms uh, that Native peoples were facing, they're consistent with, with smallpox. That started in 1520, and actually killed the Aztec emperor after Moctezuma. So there was a, a, um, a, a, a successor to Moctezuma, uh, and then he was killed because of disease. So, th so it, it, it helped to destabilize 
the Triple Alliance Empire and certainly had an active role in these events unfolding the way that they did. Then there were later epidemics, like in the 1540s and later in the 16th century, that really uh, contributed to devastating the population. Estimates are somewhere around 65 to 90 percent or so of Native peoples of Central Mexico were um, uh, uh, were killed through disease and other and you know armed conflict or overwork and other. Um, attributes of the colonial period um, in, in during the 16th century. So it had a really uh, um, catastrophic toll. The uh, self-rule question, um, roughly about 80 years, although that's like we should put self-rule there in, in scare quotes. I mean, there was uh, general autonomy in governmental matters as long as the Tlaxcal texts were good Christians. So the Spanish were you know, concerned with that. And there were friars, including one of the great documentarians, um, Toribo de Benevente, who was given the name Motolinia in Nahuatl, which means he inflicts suffering on himself. He was a Franciscan, so he was walking around you know, barefoot, took a vow of poverty. Um, and the Tlaxcal texts appreciated this. They actually expected the same from their own uh, priests. Um, and so, uh, you know, he was given this this name, and he and he had this, uh, you know, he lived in Tlaxcala, and so some of his accounts are are very good ones uh, for this one uh, particular period. The Cabildo, which is sort of the council, the colonial council, um, kept excellent records too, and many of these have been translated, and so um, you can see all sorts of land disputes. There's a wonderful document. I have one um, graduate student who is working on. Cochineal. Cochineal is the insect that grows on prickly pear that um, when you crush up their bodies, you get this very uh, um, color fast dye that famously dyed the red coats of the British uh, red. Um, so it became this big colonial industry of, of, a, of a natural dye. And a lot of classical texts were flocking to cultivate cochineal because there is now this new global industry for that or, um, or exchange for that. Um, and so some of the former nobles of Tlaxcala were complaining and saying, oh, these people aren't attending to their fields and growing corn or maize anymore. Rather, they're doing this cochineal. So there was this interesting, you know, um, insertion of this new global quasi-capitalist economy uh, in this time period and, and this, the, the dynamics that were happening in that period, all adjudicated in Nahuatl, I should say. So in the, you know, the indigenous language. And so there was that degree of autonomy uh, in politics. Um, let's see, what do we have? All right, so some of the sort of antagonisms between Tlaxcala and other places. I mean, I should say, one thing I point I didn't mention is that you know it was really the the, the dominant political systems of uh, much of Mesoamerica, but certainly Central Mexico of the time were confederations or alliances. So people had city states. Um, they actually you know the Nahuatl term for them is Altepero, which translates as water and mountains. It's sort of a political realm, a domain. Um, in fact, that image I showed with the, the mountain glyph on it, that would you know, be communicating that this is the, the uh, polity of Tlaxcala. Um, and uh, it, it, prior to Aztec expansion eastward out of the basin of Mexico, there was an alliance between Tlaxcala, Cholula, and Huejotzingo. They were three different city-states. And so they had their own small triple alliance of Puebla Tlaxcala. And then um, the, the uh, Mexica Aztecs seemed very interested in access both to Cholula, which was a really important um, pilgrimage center and market center. Uh, it was a pilgrimage called to Quetzalcoatl, the Feathered Serpent, and also the routes that head eastward from there. So there, I showed the northern routes, but there also is routes like the um, highway that goes between Veracruz and Mexico City today passes through Puebla, and that's another prominent east-west route. And so the the um, Aztec imperial expansion focused on that southern route, and it so it broke that alliance with both Huejotzingo and Cholula, um, and left Tlaxcala isolated. And so they they lost their you know their their um, their allies from that particular alliance. And so um, another question deals with like how 
how ritualistic were the wars versus pure conquest. Um, there's a mix of both. So we know that in certain instances, uh, there are these flowery wars, meaning that the goal was not to kill people on the battlefield. It was to take uh, captives back for sacrifice at the temples. Um, and those were very frequent. But occasionally, the we see that the you know Mexica rulers would you would change the rules of the game. So, for instance, if there was a real political motive for attacking a certain population, they would incentivize that to soldiers by saying like this: here, taking captives is a two for one. Like you will rise in military rank at this expedited uh, rate because you could. Um, uh, because that political motive is really important. Um, and so some of them were absolutely about more strategic control, but many others were about feeding the cosmos and playing, paying a blood debt to the religious system and the deities. Um, and, and that also involved Tlaxcala. Um, let's see. A little more on uh, disease. Um, I, yeah, I, actually, one of the I think I mentioned this maybe last week in one of the talks, but um, that you know, infectious disease. One thing I think has not been studied enough is the role of mosquito-borne illnesses and the different uh, tolls that would have had in highland versus lowland populations. So, um, so you know, the Spanish coming from a more sort of arid uh, and highland environment in general, not everybody, but um, they were more accustomed to places like the highlands of central Mexico and not so much the hot tropical lowlands of the Yucatan Peninsula. And so they didn't inhabit those areas as much, but also there were more disease vectors now transmitted through uh, mosquitoes that hadn't been present in the pre-Hispanic period. So there were some mosquitoes, but they did not have the diseases that came from Africa and the Mediterranean, uh, like malaria and yellow fever uh, and others. Um, and one final one, because I see that we sort of have to go, uh, most recent work on the Lienzo de Tlaxcala, asked by Dean Snow, a great uh, archeologist, former president of the SAAs, and who's worked in Tlaxcala. I just happen to have a couple on my desk over here. So um, I don't know if those could be seen here. So the, they're both in Spanish, um, but just the, over the last couple of years, Arqueología Mexicana is a wonderful, popular publication in uh, Mexico, and they have a whole issue on this document. And then this, this edited volume also um, is a recent uh, production. And so a lot of publications have focused, of course, on this period because it's been, um, you know, it, we've had this quincentennial and there's a, a period of, of commemoration now and rethinking how we cast all these events in the past. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I see there are so many more questions and I'm sure you could keep answering them for the next uh, hour. I wanted to share with you um, a note from the chat where um, one of our listeners says, I appreciate the master class given in such a brief window of time. Your students are very lucky indeed. And I think we all share that uh, that opinion. Thank you so much for this talk. It was truly fantastic. Uh, for everyone who's here in the audience, again, if you'd like to watch this video, we'll have it available on our YouTube channel shortly. And if you missed David's Archaeology Hour talk earlier this month, it's already up on the YouTube channel. I want to encourage everyone who is here today to stay connected with the AIA, become a member, support our programs, and we'll keep you informed about what we've been doing. David's talks this month are part of a larger lecture series. We have one last speaker for this year's series of virtual lectures next month, when we'll be talking with Dr. Sarah Gonzalez, of the University of Washington about what it means to do archaeology with and for an indigenous nation. She'll draw on her experiences working with the confederated tribes of the Grand Ronde community of Oregon on April 18th and April 19th for AIA Archaeology Hour 
and then on April 27th for Archaeology Abridged. So be sure to register if you haven't already. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out today. And thank you, David, for spending so much time with us over the last week and a half. It's been Thanks for tuning a in, everyone. pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Goodbye for now.